Please turn in your Bibles to Peter's first letter, 1 Peter. We've been going through 1 Peter, Sunday mornings. It's a very appropriate hymn we've just sung. If there's a title to the sermon this morning, it is simply The Power of the Cross. The Power of the Cross. We're looking especially at the end of chapter 2. That's where we've got to in 1 Peter. But I'm going to start by reading the first three verses of chapter 1. And then, so that we better understand the context, chapter 2, starting at verse 18. And we normally stand for the reading of God's word just as a reminder that this is the word of God. So please stand with me. 1 Peter, chapter 1, starting at verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect, Exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And chapter 2, verse 18, he writes, verse 18, chapter 2, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure? This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return, when he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Please have a seat. <coughs> Daniel Steens was a faithful American pastor. He pastored in a city in America called Philadelphia about a hundred years ago. He taught the Bible faithfully. He pastored the sheep faithfully. At the end of one meeting, when Stins had been preaching, a man approached him. And it's reported that he said the following. He said, I don't like your preaching. I do not care for the cross. I think that instead of preaching the death of Christ on the cross, it would be better to teach on Jesus the teacher and example. Daniel Stins very shrewdly replied, 
Would you be willing to follow him if I preach Christ as the example? The man said, I would. I would follow him in that case. Stein said then, let us take the first step. He did no sin. Can you take that step? The man looked confused. He replied, no, I, I do sin and I acknowledge it. Well then, said Steens, you fir- your first need of Christ is not as an example, but as a saviour. And the truth is that all of us gathered here this morning are sinners. We all rebel against Almighty God, our triune God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And God has made it plain that he will not leave the guilty unpunished. So we all need a saviour to save us from the wrath of God. We read in 1 Peter chapter 2 how Peter, writing to these struggling Christians, he tells them, look, think about Christ at Calvary. When you're suffering unjustly, he's the example that you're to follow. If you want to do well in the midst of suffering, follow Christ's example. But if that was all that Christ accomplished at the cross. Well, woe is me. Woe is you. If what he did at Calvary is just an example to follow, we're in dire trouble. But Peter cannot leave it there. And so he goes as his mind is is turning to the cross, speaking about Christ as an example to these beleaguered Christians, He also says to them, but there's much more that Christ accomplished at the cross. And so he tells us, he tells you and me what it is that Christ did for his people at Calvary. What he himself accomplished for his people. Remember his writing to those who by the great mercy of God have been born again. Those who have been ransomed by the blood of Christ. Those who have tasted that the Lord is good. And he says to them, just remember what Christ did at Calvary, such that he was able to cry out, it is finished. Mission accomplished. So this morning we're going to look at what it is that Christ accomplished at Calvary. What did he get done there? What has he done for his people? Let me pray for us before we dive in. Great and gracious God, as we come to that most sacred of grounds, the the cross, would you please Give us power to grasp what it is that Christ did there. The message of the cross that is foolishness to those who are perishing. Grant us eyes to see and hearts to respond, we pray. For your glory, and we ask in Christ's precious name. Amen. So we're going to look at three accomplishments of Christ at the cross. Our first point then, Christ substituted himself for his people. Christ substituted himself for his people. Look with me, chapter 2, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Peter no doubt is very mindful of the promises in the Old Testament scriptures about the one who was coming to save his people from their sins. And most especially Isaiah 53, when you go home, you can read through the end of Isaiah 52 and chapter 53 and see how he's borrowing language from that chapter. 
and not least in what he says in verse 24. It's as if he's saying, you heard about this one that was coming to save his people? Well, this is Jesus of Nazareth. He himself, it was him who bore our sins, carried the heavy burden of our sins. He, the Lord Jesus Christ, was the one who took up our sins and bore them. He carried them. But what did he do with them? We're grateful, aren't we, for refuse collectors. We put our bags out, our black bin bags out by the gate. And the bags are full of smelly, putrid, worthless rubbish. And they come along and they pick these bags up and they throw them in the back of the truck. But what happens to them? They don't magic them away. They take them somewhere, maybe to a landfill site. They get them out of the way so that we can't see that rubbish anymore. We read here of the Lord Jesus Christ. He himself bore our sins. What did he do with that burden. This is not just bags of rubbish. This is sin. This is serious waste. This is more serious than all the nuclear waste on the whole of the planet Earth put together. Because God hates sin. God seriously hates sin. Scripture tells us he hates pride. He hates lying. He hates violence. He hates gossip. He hates unkindness. He hates it intensely. So our sin is serious. And here God's word tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. What does that mean? Well, remember, Peter is a, a Jew. He knows the Old Testament. He's talking about something that Christ did once for all in his body on the tree at a real place in history, at a real time, but Peter uses this word tree or wood rather than the usual word cross. And he's referencing Deuteronomy, where it speaks about the fact that anyone who's hanged on a tree is cursed by God. If a man, we read Deuteronomy 21, has committed a crime punishable by death, it's a serious crime, and is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day, which, remember, is what they did with the Lord Jesus Christ, because they hated to see this man hanging on a tree, especially at this holy feast. Bury him the same day, for a hanged man, listen to this, is cursed by God. You understand what it means to be cursed by God? It's the opposite of blessing. It's the opposite of having God's favour. It is to have God's holy anger against you. It is for God to punish, to pour out his wrath, his fury upon you. And that's what Christ did at Calvary. You know, children, what it is to disobey your parents. I hope that if you disobey your parents willingly and knowingly, that you expect trouble. You expect consequences. The wages of sin is death. The rebellion against Almighty God, it's serious. Galatians 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. 
For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Christ Jesus was accursed for us. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. This verse smells of Isaiah 53. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. We all like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him that burden, the iniquity of us all. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, for he shall bear their iniquities. He poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many. He bore the sin of many. It wasn't the nails or the beating. It was Christ in the darkness for those three hours being treated as if he had committed all your sin, all my sin. It was the fury, the wrath of the Father poured out on him who knew no sin. In my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a saviour. My pardon, my forgiveness. It comes not through doing penance, not by visiting the local priest, not by me turning over a new leaf, not me trying to be a better person, coming to church, giving to poor people, but only through the Lord Jesus Christ who was crushed in the place of his people. Christ substituted himself for his people. Let me illustrate this in the words of a story. It's familiar to some of you. It's a story written really for children by a lady called Patricia Sinjan. It was a story about two brothers, Louis and Sebastian. Louis and Sebastian, they lived in Greece in a little flat-roofed house just outside the town, outside the village. They were twins. You couldn't tell them alike, apart. Twins, Louis and Sebastian. But they were so very different in their behaviour. Sebastian was hard-working and upright. He went out and did a job and he provided for them. He worked on the house when it needed fixing. But Louis, he was a drunkard and a sluggard. He just lazed around all the time. And then in the evenings, he went out drinking. Well, one evening, Sebastian is at home by candlelight. He's reading when he heard running footsteps coming towards the door. It was dark outside. His brother Louis burst through the door and he said, Brother, you've got to help me, help me. Uh, and he was all dishevelled, uh, dirty, and there was all blood on his shirt. And Sebastian said, What's happened? What have you done? He said, I didn't mean to do it. Uh, we got into a fight and I killed a man and they're after me. And sure enough, Sebastian could hear the crowd running towards his home. And without a word, Sebastian took off his shirt and, and, and gave him some trousers and he said, put these clothes on quickly. And, and Louis is putting the clean clothes on and, and Sebastian takes his shirt and he says, run up into the hills and, and don't come back for a long time. Hide. And at that moment... As Louis went out the back door, the militia came in the front door. And Sebastian was arrested and he was tried. He was arrested wearing his brother's blood-stained shirt. 
Uh, and when the judge asked him, have you nothing to say, he simply replied, you saw my blood-stained shirt. He was condemned to death and he was executed. Well, Louis ran up to the hills and he found a job on a farm. And a while later, he returned. He'd grown a beard and he went into the, the marketplace just overhearing he wanted to hear what had happened to his brother. And at one point in time, the locals were talking about this murderer. And so Louis said, well, what, what happened? Did they give up trying to find him? The murderer, I mean. And they said, give up? Of course not. They caught him that same night. And a couple of weeks later, he was executed. Nobody knows what happened to that faithless brother of his, but of course, Louis didn't hear anymore. He was hot-footing it to the governor's house, and he banged on the governor's door, and the governor eventually opened the door, and he said, you've killed an innocent man. You killed an innocent man, and the governor asked him to explain himself. And he said, it was my brother Sebastian that you killed. He was an innocent man. I was the murderer. You must arrest and punish me. Well, the governor withdrew. And after much consultation, he returned and he said, the law says a life for a life. If your brother was innocent, we didn't know. The only defense he made was you saw the blood-stained shirt. Case is closed. We do not want to kill two men for one. Go and keep your mouth shut. See that you make no more trouble. Louis was distraught as he left the governor's home. The governor called after him. He said, are you his only brother? And he said, yes, I am. He said, well, your brother wrote you a letter. And he gave him a letter. And he took it home. And by candlelight... He read. It was short. He read it over and over again. It said, My dear Louis, this morning I shall die of my own free will in your place and in your blood-stained shirt. Now you can live in my clean shirt. I send you my love as always. May God bless you, Sebastian. And Louis understood. The drunkard, the sluggard, had died on the day that Sebastian had been executed and now he could live a new life. So the following morning he got up and he washed and he left the house and he went out and found himself a job, a new day and a new beginning. It's only a story. But about 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. The million dollar question is, for whom did Christ die? Isaiah 53 is very clear that he bore the sins of many. Who are they? It's interesting when you read this part of 1 Peter that Peter has changed from addressing these believers, you, 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 See what he, he says in verse 24. He himself bore our sins. Thinking of Christ on the cross, he can't help but think with gratitude. He bore my sins in his body on the tree. Paul was able to say, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. Did he give himself for you? For whom did Christ die? It's for those who have been born again. It is for those who are new creatures through their union with Christ. It's those who have been granted the gift of faith and repentance. It is those who are trusting in Christ alone that he gave himself for them. Following Christ obediently and thankfully. Friend, if you are not today trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ 
didn't give himself for you. He didn't substitute himself for you if you are not trusting him, if you're not following him. And there's no other place you can go. There's no other one who can do this, who can accomplish this great work. No one who could bear the wrath of the Father completely, take it away. If you're not trusting in Christ, you stand condemned. The guilty one. And you will have to bear the penalty for your sin one day. But Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners. If you understand this, come to Christ today. Turn from your sin, turn from your self-righteousness and trust Christ. Come to Christ today. Wouldn't it be great If you could remember this day as the day when you turned from your sin to Christ. You found life in him. Leon Morris wrote this. To put it bluntly and plainly, if Christ is not my substitute, I still occupy the place of a condemned sinner. If my sins and my guilt are not transferred to him, if he did not take them upon himself, then surely they remain on me. He writes, if he did not deal with my sins, I must face their consequences. Are you ready for that? If my penalty was not borne by him, it still hangs over me. What's stopping you from coming to Christ? Submit to his lordship. Trust him for the life that he gives through what he accomplished at Calvary. Christ substituted himself for his people. And brothers and sisters in Christ, you need to know that he accomplished this at Calvary. He paid for all your sins. It's not singular. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. The blood of Christ cleanses us of all our sins, we read in 1 John. All your guilt, all your shame for all your sins, for your pride and arrogance, for your selfishness, for your slandering others, for your idolatry, for putting God in second place, for your greed and covetousness, for your lack of self-control, for your unkind words, for all the punishment that you deserve because of your sin was laid on Christ on that day in his body on the tree once and for all a historical event this is what Christ accomplished again Leon Morris says was there a price to be paid he paid it was there a victory to be won he won it was there a penalty to be borne he bore it was there a judgment To be judged, he faced it. The bliss, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. God's people said, amen, amen and amen. What a saviour. Secondly, Christ liberated his people from the power of sin. Christ liberated, set free his people from the power of sin. Verse 24, he himself bore our sins 
in his body on the tree that, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. That, so that, this is the purpose. This is the reason why Christ bore the sins of his people. This is why the Father crushed his Son at Calvary. That we might die to sin. This word means uh, not literally to die, to stop breathing, body and spirit to separate, but it means to decisively separate from something. Uh, and so to die is a good translation. To decisively separate from sin. This is something that happened this was accomplished at Calvary. And so just to drive this point home, he says that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. And this is not talking about physical illness. This is not being... Uh, healed of, of lameness, for example, or of cancer, although all of that is a result of the curse. But this is about being deformed and corrupted and twisted by sin, having our thinking and our wills corrupted and distorted by sin. And so we are healed of that. We are new creatures. And we're no longer under the power of sin. We've been healed so that we might live healthy lives. It would be ridiculous, wouldn't it, if having been laid down with foot and mouth disease, and some of you, you know what it is, and it's debilitating and it's hard, and you're in bed and you're feeling weary, and the doctor comes and has got some miracle cure, and cures you. And you're no longer weary and the blisters have all gone. But you stay in bed. And the whole week goes by and you stay in bed and the doctor comes and tells you, I've cured you, you're healed. And you stay in bed. It's nonsense, isn't it? That doesn't honour the doctor at all. You might think, well, I, I'm not sure that I really am well. The doctor says, no, I've healed you. You're well. Get out of bed. Well, the scripture here speaks of an even greater miracle. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. You've been made new. You've not only been saved from the penalty of sin, as if that is not glorious enough, you have been saved from the power of sin. You've been liberated. You've been set free so that you can live wholeheartedly for the one that set you free. So that you could decisively turn from a life of sin and live for the glory of God. Unbelievers are slaves to sin. They're still blind. They're still in darkness. But if you're in Christ, you've been set free. You've been made alive together with Christ. It's what we read of in Romans 6. It's what we're going to be doing when we baptize Ruvolt and Leto. It's a demonstration of what they have through their union with Christ who died and was raised from the dead. In Romans 6, we read, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death 
in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, and it's not when we immerse them in water that that happens. It's when sovereignly, graciously, the Holy Spirit united these men to the Lord Jesus Christ. And all that Christ had accomplished at Calvary, well now, they benefit from that. They've been crucified with him and raised with him to new life. Paul writes, if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. The old man is dead. Women, boys, girls, if you're in Christ, the old boy, the old girl, the old man, the old woman is dead. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Calvin, John Calvin, the reformer, says there is power in Christ's death to mortify our flesh, to put to death our flesh. Amen. Last year we went to the Drakensberg Mountains and there's a wonderful uh, place there, Falcon Ridge, and it's where they uh, rehabilitate birds of prey. Marshall Eagle, Crowned Eagle, Peregrine Falcon, beautiful birds. Uh, most of them have been found uh, maybe poisoned or hit by a car or something. And so they put them in cages and they rehabilitate them and, and they put on shows and you see these birds flying. Imagine one of those birds being raised from a chick and it's in this cage and it's given all that it needs but the owners decide, no, we're going to give it its freedom. We're going to liberate it. And they open uh, the cage and they get the bird out and it's a beautiful martial eagle if you've seen them flying. Amazing. And it stands there and it goes around pecking the ground. Go on! goes around pecking the ground and the dogs come. These owners have got dogs and the dogs come and suddenly this, this martial eagle scurries back into the cage. You'd be thinking, that's dumb. Why doesn't it just flap its wings? And when you see these birds, they just... And off they go. We've been liberated. Brother, sister in Christ, we've been liberated from the power of sin so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, so that we might live a holy, joyful, God-honoring life by the grace that he provides. We're no longer fast-bound in sin and nature's night. We've been set free because Christ died and Christ was raised from the dead. By his wounds, you've been healed. That was accomplished at Calvary. What does it mean? What does it mean to die to sin and live to righteousness? Well, it doesn't mean legalism. If you missed last week's sermon, Pastor Nell came here, listen to it. It doesn't mean that we live by a set of rules. That's not what it means to live to righteousness. It means that we have been transformed, that we have new hearts and our desires have changed. So we see that lady who's immodestly dressed and actually, well, that's not going to satisfy. I'm satisfied in Christ. So we turn our eyes away. It's not that it's a rule that I've made. It's not a duty, but I want to please the Lord. I wander through the mall. I go past the the car sales rooms and, I, and I'm no longer enticed by those things. I've got different affections, different desires. My heart has changed. That bill comes. I get an email and it was unexpected. And I don't 
have to be anxious. I might be, I still sin, but I don't have to be anxious because I can trust my Father in heaven. Because he said, if I seek his kingdom and his righteousness, he'll give me all that I need. He did not spare his own son. Will he not also in him give us all things? I know that he loves me and cares for me. And everything belongs to him. So I don't have to be anxious. Because I've been set free from the power of sin. It's this dying to sin and living to righteousness is not legalism. But neither is it libertarianism. That is, to throw my hands up and say, well, grace abounds so sin can abound all the more. He's paid for all my sin, so it doesn't matter how I live. Well, that's the cry of someone who's unregenerated, who doesn't know what it is. But Christ gave himself, himself for them. I'm not going to presume on God's kindness nor am I going to think that I'm still a slave to sin. Well, I'm human after all. You don't have to sin. You've been set free from the power of sin. This is what John MacArthur wrote. He says, in God's redemptive act, in a person's heart, true holiness is as much a gift from God as is the new birth and the spiritual life it brings. A regeneration with that new heart, we have new desires, new affections. Our eyes are opened, we see the glory of God in Christ and we love him. He goes on to say, the life that is not basically marked by holiness has no claim to salvation. He says, there is no such thing as divine life without divine living. If we're a new creation through our union with Christ, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creature. The old has gone, it's passed away, the new has come. We're in Christ. We've died with him and been raised with him. We're going to live different lives. We're not yet glorified. But the goal of our lives, the aim of our lives, the desires of our hearts have changed there's no such thing as divine life without divine living. Christ has liberated his people from the power of sin. Being united with him, we've died with him, we've been raised to new life with him. The old man is dead, I'm a new creature. Christ substituted himself for his people. Christ liberated his people from the power of sin. And lastly, Christ arrested his sheep and brought them under his care. Christ arrested his sheep and brought them under his care. We're thinking about what Christ accomplished at Calvary. The work that he finished at Calvary. What he achieved at Calvary. Verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Hallelujah. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed. Hallelujah. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You were straying like sheep. Again, this is Isaiah 53 language, isn't it? We all like sheep have gone astray. And if you know that verse, Isaiah 53 verse 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each have turned to his own way. This straying, this wandering away from the shepherd is not accidental. It's intentional. It's willful. The grass is bound to be greener over in that field. I don't really like this shepherd telling me where to go and what to do. I'd like to be independent of this shepherd. That's what it means. This is culpable sin, straying from the shepherd. 
but have now returned to the shepherd. It sounds rather like, well, I heard the gospel and I didn't want to go to hell. I thought a better option would be life, so I threw my lot in with Jesus. (laughs) It's not what he's saying. Well, I realise that the Christian life is pretty good. You know, being amongst the people who care for one another and they encourage one another and bear one another's burdens and counsel one another. Sounds like, I'm going to throw my lot in with these people. They're kind, lovely people. That's not what he means either. In fact, this word, now returned, is a passive verb which means it's not what the sheep did, but what the shepherd did. Literally, you were turned around. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Hence, the word I've used, Christ arrested us. Here we are going off into dangerous pastures and he grabbed hold of us. And took hold of us and saved us. You were heading in completely the wrong direction, not realizing the danger that you were in, away from God. You didn't even realize it. And friends, let me tell you, the most dangerous place to be if you are an unbeliever, listen to this, the most dangerous place to be if you're an unbeliever is in church because you're self-righteous and you think you're okay and it's like a sheep straying into another field with such yummy grass not realizing that it's poisonous and the shepherd knows and he keeps you away from it sheep is not very flattering sheep are stupid animals this is what one commentator writes sheep are notoriously dull prone to stray and helpless to find their way back. It's you and me, by nature, in spite of what you think of yourself. Straying sheep, lost in the wilderness or mountains and exposed to wild beasts and destruction, present a wretched picture of the needy state of the lost. Sheep need a shepherd to care for them because they're dumb animals. And there are so many dangers, fast flowing rivers that they might drown in, cliffs that they might fall over, poisonous weeds that they might eat. That's quite apart from wolves and and lions that existed at this time, thieves who might kidnap them. And so from the very beginning, from Adam's sin, we have all turned to his own way, to her own way like sheep. And apart from Christ seeking us and saving us, we are helpless and lost. Another writer, wayward, purposeless, dangerous and helpless wandering of lost sinners, sheep without a shepherd. But at Calvary, he paid the penalty for my sins. He set me free to live a God-honoring life and he arrested me, he laid hold of me, he turned me around and brought me to himself. This is beautiful language, isn't it? Verse 25, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned, been turned around to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This speaks about relationship. It's not just that he took you away from the weeds that are poisonous. He brought you to himself. He brought you to himself that he might care for you, that he might guide you and lead you and keep watch over you. That's an overseer. We understand what a shepherd does so that he might protect you and guard you against danger because you need him doesn't save us and leave us on our own. That would be dreadful. But he's with us. Our shepherd and our overseer. 
It speaks about relationship. It's because of what he has sovereignly and graciously done that we can say the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters, not dangerous ones. He restores my soul. And I'm discouraged and disheartened. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even some that are painful, the trials that I go through, he, he leads me through the valley of the shadow of death, even. But when I'm there, his rod and his staff, they comfort me. He's with me. He's caring for me. He's the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep, who said, my sheep follow me. They hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and no one can snatch them from my hand. And so he's turned us around and taken hold of us. He's our shepherd. He's the overseer of our souls. And so I, I trust him, and I obey him, and I gladly and joyfully follow him, trust his goodness and his wisdom. This was a great comfort for these believers. Remember, this is the context in, in 1 Peter of these believers being ill-treated for doing what is right. And the comfort that he gives them, not only the example of Christ, this is the footsteps that you're to follow, but he says, just consider Christ. Consider what he's saved you from, what he's accomplished at Calvary. Consider his great love for you. And consider the fact that he's taken hold of you, he's arrested you, and brought you to himself that he might care for you, to the praise of his glorious grace. Surely this must comfort and encourage us. We live in a hostile world. We might not all suffer injustice, when we're doing right, but the chances are we do at times, and there are other things that we suffer. But nothing will separate us from such love. Tribulation, distress, persecution, danger, sword, unjust beatings at the hand of my master. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed for you were straying like sheep but have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Our great and gracious God, thank you for such sovereign love. Oh, grant that we would be those who live lives trusting you, delighting in you, and enjoying you, our good shepherd, who gave himself for us, and who is coming again for us. Amen.